Throughout the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined in our collective memory. Be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well-known, but not necessarily well-known nationwide. By no means am I a historian, but I am fascinated by the history of our country, and I want to tell as many of these stories as I can. And if I can pass along my passion for the history of Canada to at least one other person, it makes this endeavor all the worth the while. Welcome to Canadian History with Stephen Wilson. In our last episode, we talked about how the initial planning of the invasion of Quebec went and the force under the command of Richard Montgomery that had captured Fort St. John and was now in position to capture Montreal. The other part of the American Continental Army's plan for the invasion of Quebec included a secondary force under the command of Benedict Arnold, which would come through the wilderness of what is now Maine and take Quebec City. When the invasion of Quebec was originally proposed to the Continental Congress by Arnold and Ethan Allen, it was proposed that the attack would originate from Fort Ticonderoga. This plan was dismissed at first, But after hearing that fortifications were being improved along Lake Champlain by the British as a possible launching a point for attacks from Quebec into New York, the Congress put General Philip Schuyler in charge of the invasion. Feeling slighted after being overlooked for the job, Arnold went to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where George Washington was encamped. The idea proposed by Arnold to Washington would be for a secondary force that would come from the east into Quebec aimed at Quebec City. Washington agreed with the idea, but wanted to ensure Schuyler was on board. After all, the two forces wouldn't need to coordinate their attacks at times. The plan proposed by Arnold called for the American forces to leave from Newburyport, Massachusetts. They would sail along the coast to the Kennebec River, going upriver to Fort Western. From there, they would transfer to shallow draft boats and continue up the river to Lake Megantic, and then take the Chaudière River to Quebec City. The trek from Fort Western to Quebec City was only supposed to be 180 miles, and Arnold expected it would take 20 days. He planned his trip based on a map and journal that had been compiled by a British military engineer, John Montracer, back in 1760. There was a problem with the map, however, as it wasn't detailed, and there were a number of inaccuracies as well as details that appeared to have been deliberately removed or even obscured, This would be a key factor as the expedition went on. A letter from Washington to Schuyler about the expedition was sent on August 20th, and a reply received on September 2nd. In the interim, Arnold was introduced to a boat builder from Maine by the name of Reuben Colburn. Colburn offered his services, and he would provide to Arnold details such as potential British naval threats, what the attitudes of indigenous people in the area were, where supplies would be available, and how long it would take to have enough bateau or shallow draft boats constructed. Colburn would head off to Maine to prepare, while Washington and Arnold began raising troops for the expedition, as well as gathering supplies. For many American soldiers, there had been little action around Boston after the Battle of Bunker Hill in June. They were supporting a siege, but were eager to take part in action. When the call came out, several soldiers volunteered, Arnold would take 750 men, who would then be split into three battalions. The first battalion would be under Lieutenant Colonel Roger Enos, the second under Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Green, and the third under Daniel Morgan. This third battalion was made up of primarily riflemen from Virginia and Pennsylvania. These frontiermen had been a handful for commanders since arriving at Boston, so it was felt that putting them into the wilderness may be a better use for their talents. After the recruitment, the American forces that would be leaving for Quebec numbered around 1,100. Among these men, Aaron Burr, who would be a future vice president and one of the first Americans ever charged with treason. Also part of the force was Henry Dearborn, who was the commanding general of the American army during the War of 1812. 
Before leaving, Washington wrote again to Schuyler about the reception Arnold's expedition would receive in Canada, particularly from the indigenous people. The commander-in-chief noted he had been told by an Abenaki chief that, quote, the Indians of Canada in general, and also the French, are greatly in our favor and determined not to act against us. The first step taken by Arnold was finding ships that would get the force from Newburyport to the Kennebec River and Port Western without attracting the attention of the Royal Navy. These ships were arranged by a friend of Arnold's, Nathaniel Tracy. The expedition left Cambridge on September 11th and marched to Newburyport. First to leave were men from the area, with the last troops leaving on September 13th. Arnold himself arrived on September 15th, and after delays due to weather, they left from Newburyport on the ships on the 19th. It would take roughly just 12 hours for the fleet to arrive at the Kennebec River, and they would spend two days navigating it. By the 23rd, they were in Fort Western, where they met up with Colburn, who had been constructing the bateau. Arnold, however, found the bateau to be poorly constructed and not to the sizes specified. As a result, the next three days were spent building more bateau. The departure of the Americans from Newburyport was not unnoticed by the British. General Thomas Gage in Boston had noted the troops had left, but the original suspicion was that they were headed for Halifax, a major port in Nova Scotia. The governor of Nova Scotia, Francis Legge, issued martial law and sent a rumor-filled letter to England about what the American actions were. It turned out that all of those rumors were false. It wouldn't be until October 17th that the British would receive accurate information about the American activities, confirming they had headed up to Kennebec with an intended target of Quebec City. On September 25th, the force left Fort Western. The riflemen under the command of Morgan blazed a trail when needed, and a rear guard composed of Colburn and his boatwrights kept the bateau in repair. Ahead of the column were two scouting parties. One went up to Lake Megantic, while the other surveyed the route to the Dead River, looking to find a spot known among the indigenous people of the area as the Great Carrying Place, as they would have to portage around it. Intelligence for the proposed route also told of a large Mohawk force near French settlements along the Chaudière River, These reports, however, were dismissed by Arnold. The first stop after Fort Western was at the derelict fortress Fort Halifax. They reached that point on the 27th. Then the men sent out for Norwich Walk Falls, reaching the point on October 2nd. However, what had started out as high spirits among the men when setting out was turning into low morale. The bateau were leaking. Food was spoiling. The boats were needing to be pulled at some points, and illness was starting to set in. The Americans would need to portage around Norwich Mock Falls, just a mile. However, this venture would require a week of time, with local settlers having to help with pulling the bateau with oxen. They would arrive at the Great Carrying Place by October 11th. The obstacles, though, continued to mount in front of them. Writing in 1867, Edwin Martin Stone said, The streams were rapid and hard to navigate. Boats were dashed to pieces, and the hardy voyagers barely escaped watery graves. The autumn storms were cold and piercing. Encampments were flooded by overflowing rivers. Swamps and morasses spread in the track of the advancing column. Little confidence was felt in the intelligence of guides who were leading them daily, deeper into an almost unknown wilderness. Provisions had become exhausted, roots, dog meat, soup made of rawhide moccasins, and entrails broiled on coals became luxuries, and death by starvation stared them in the face. It required nerves of steel to survey the prospect before them with calmness, much less with hope, and the question of return was often discussed. The Great Carrying Place was a portage that went around an unnavigable stretch of the Dead River, which was a tributary of the Kennebec. The leader of the survey team noted the route was a bad road, but capable of being made good. This was, if we're being generous, the most optimistic view of the situation. What his notes did not disclose was that heavy rains had turned the path into a bog. Some of the men fell sick, drinking stagnant water. And then the first fatality of the expedition came when a falling tree killed a man. Those who were ill were sent back to Fort Halifax as needed. 
The first men reached the Dead River via the 12-mile portage on October 13th. Arnold himself would reach the point on the 16th, and he dispatched letters to Washington and Montgomery to keep them apprised of his progress. However, some of these letters were intercepted and ended up in the hands of the Lieutenant Governor of Quebec, Hector Theophilus de Cramay. This would be the intelligence the British would get to confirm what was happening. The journey would resume, with Arnold sending his survey team out again, this time to mark the complete trail to Lake Megantic. The rest of the team would follow slowly, dealing with the currents of the river as it flowed against them towards the Kennebec. The men were put on half rations, with soldiers trying to supplement them as much as possible by finding local wildlife, such as moose, duck, and deer. Heavy rains began again on the 19th of October, with the river starting to rise. The morning of the 22nd, they found their camp underwater, despite moving to higher ground. This would set them back a day, with the expedition again resuming on the 23rd, but more misfortune would befall the Americans. A group of men would end up going down a branch of the Dead River, thanks to the high water. Then the remaining food stores would be spoiled. This prompted even Arnold himself to consider returning. The morale of the men and the changing views of the officers prompted a council of war to be held. The opinions of the younger officers were heard from first, with the youngest, a Captain Ward, leading off. He was in favor of advancing, and he was seconded by Captains Thayer and Topham, with Lieutenant Colonel Green and Enos agreeing, as did Major Bigelow. Dissenting views were heard from Captains Williams, McCobb, and Scott, as well as Adjutant Hyde and Lieutenant Pierce. The decision to advance was carried by a single vote, and many who dissented resolved to head back anyway. This included Enos, and even though he was in favor of continuing, as many of the companies that were leaving were part of his battalion. Now down by 450 men, Arnold's force continued. The advance group would reach Lake Megantic on the 27th and confirmed with the group of Penobscot that they were not far from the furthest south community on the Chaudière, Sardigan. As the rest of the men made their way to the advance group, they would have to continue to deal with terrible conditions, including some parts of the column becoming lost in the swamps as the route provided to them was based on inaccurate information on that map from Montrezer and not what the advance party had actually encountered. Arnold himself first contacted residents of the area on October 30th. He gave them a letter that was provided to him by Washington, saying that they were not there for quarrel with the people of Quebec, but rather the British. Many of the people who he met were sympathetic to their plight, and they provided provisions and care for the ill, many refusing payment to do so. It was there that the Americans were told of the orders that all bateaux discovered on the south shore of the St. Lawrence had been destroyed after the interception of communication between Arnold and Montgomery. The expedition finally reached Point Levis across the St. Lawrence River from Quebec on November 9th. The journey was to have been 20 days and cover 180 miles. They traveled nearly double that, covering 350 miles in 45 days. It was also then Arnold had learned of the interception of his dispatches to Montgomery. A mill in the area owned by New Jersey businessman John Halstead would be the mustering point for the remaining 600 men, and they crossed the river in the overnight hours of November 13th and 14th, setting up a camp on the Plains of Abraham. Arnold sent a negotiator with a flag of truce to the city demanding its surrender. Lieutenant Colonel Alan McLean, commanding a force of roughly a 1,000 men comprised of the Royal Highland emigrants, militiamen, and 400 marines, rejected the demand for surrender. Arnold didn't press the point either, as his force had no means to start a siege, let alone maintain it for any period of time. Arnold lacked artillery. Each man had just five cartridges. Clothing was reduced to rags after the 45 days in the wilderness, and more than a 100 muskets were useless. Fearing a sortie from the city, he opted to withdraw to Pointe aux Trembles, located roughly 20 miles upriver and he waited for Montgomery. Moving back to the Montgomery expedition, they were having a vastly different experience than that of Arnold's force. 
Under Montgomery, Fort St. John had fallen to the Americans on November 3rd. On November 8th, his troops had occupied St. Paul's Island in the St. Lawrence River. And then they crossed to Point St. Charles on the 9th. They were on the outskirts of Montreal. With the fall of Fort St. John resulting in a mass desertion of militiamen in Montreal, Sir Guy Carleton, the governor of Quebec and the commander of the forces in Montreal, opted to withdraw from the city, citing that it was virtually indefensible. The Americans moved into the city on November 13th as Carleton raced to make it to Quebec before being captured. He set off by boat down the St. Lawrence, but they were approached by a ship under a flag of truce. The American ship demanded surrender, stating there was a gauntlet of cannon downstream that would destroy the convoy. Carleton snuck off his ship and looked to take the rest of the journey while the fleet surrendered. Writing in his book, Our Struggle for the 14th Colony, Canada and the American Revolution, Justin Harvey Smith described the scene. Thursday night, November 16th, he, that is Carleton, with great difficulty persuaded Bichette, one of his captains, to risk a voyage past the American artillery. Dressing like a man of the people and attended only by one or two of his Canadian officers, he embarked in a whaleboat and with muffled oars glided silently down the river. At the most critical point, laying oars aside, the men paddled with their hands. A secret channel through the islands opposite Sorel aided them. And in this, the wise destiny of Canada, disguised as a village boor, escaped from the shears. Montgomery, though, had won the day. He had taken Montreal, and now nothing lay between him and Quebec, where he would be able to join up with Arnold and lay siege to that city. The capital of Quebec, the last bastion of Britain in the province. However, it would all depend on how Carleton would respond. Montgomery would have his own issues to worry about in Montreal before leaving, though. He published messages from the Continental Congress for the people of Montreal. He started discussions with sympathizers about holding a convention to select delegates from Montreal and Quebec for the Congress. He also wrote to Schuyler asking that a delegation be sent to Montreal for diplomatic purposes. Montgomery also had to deal with expiring enlistments. He would end up losing nearly half of his force and was left with 500 men. He left 200 of those in Montreal under the command of David Wooster and departed with the other 200 on November 28th. He would meet up with the 1st Canadian Regiment, a unit that would be made up of Canadiens who would fight in the Continental Army. Numbering around 200, this would bolster Montgomery's force, and his 400, nearly 500 men, set out for pointe aux Tremblay. They would arrive on December 2nd, bringing much-needed supplies for Arnold's force, including winter clothing. Three days later, the Continental Army found itself again on the Plains of Abraham, and the Siege of Quebec would begin. In our next episode, we will look at one of the most pivotal battles of not just the Revolutionary War, but Canadian and American history, the Battle of Quebec. If you want to be able to have ad-free access to our podcast, get bonus content including copies of our scripts, take part in our monthly AMAs, or even want some merch, join us on Patreon. You can find the link in the description of the podcast. If you just enjoy listening to the podcast but don't want to sign up for Patreon, you can still support us by listening each and every week to every new episode. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Canadian History with Stephen Wilson.